Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Shabbat I am so glad I had the opportunity to come to this day. And uh, uh, at the end of the reading of the book, we say, Hasah Hasah Beni Hasek. What it means is, be strong, be strong, be strengthened. Um, the finishing the book always brings to us to many, many uh, special uh, ideas and uh, we need to start rethinking about what we have learned during all this period of time. Let me tell you, this book, Bemikva, the book of numbers, is, 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 is really a very special book because it's going to describe us from the second year of the exit from Israel to the ending at, at the moment that we are at the gates or the doors of the promised land, it is Israel. In that period of time, they have passed two generations. The generation who left Egypt, plus now the new generation that is coming into the promised land. You know, the generation who left Egypt, they were carrying on a lot of baggage. Um, they had many problems, and during that period of time, they had situations that were very difficult. But um, our Creator, blessed be His name, managed to take care of His people under the leadership of Moshe Rabbeinu, a great teacher and prophet, Moses. He was the elected one. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is a type of Mashiach. Uh, for us Jewish people, we will see him as a very special uh, leader for Israel. Interestingly enough, in the last uh, drashes that I had been speaking, I had been trying to talk to you a little bit about leadership. Um, and it's important because I mentioned to you before that all of us we are leaders. Sometimes we are reluctant leaders, and sometimes we are very active leaders. But always, our Creator is calling us uh, to be a leader. Men, you have a very important responsibility and role, in beginning with your home, beginning with, uh, with your community, beginning on, in, your, in your job and your place of work. Now, Times have changed, and today we cannot any longer talk about the roles of men and the roles of women, because we are more, than, more or less very confused in this world. And it's, to me, it's sad, because the Torah gives you certain principles that are very important. And it is not about differentiation, about who is better than the other. But uh, it gives you your roles in order that you uh, work in the area you are being made for. You know, uh, I always say to women, you know, you uh, go down to the to the ladder if you want to be like a man. And I say to men, you know, uh, if you like if you like to be to a woman is impossible. Okay? Because women are very special, made by our Creator for a reason. You know, uh, women are the only one that can uh, bring a child to to life. They are they, they have something that we as men we can never ever be able to relate to. It's about bringing life. No, um, and this is a part that sadly enough, today, the most precious thing that a woman can achieve has been put it down by women, not by men, by women. And this is sad to me because they want to be so much like men that they don't, they don't mind to decline or to, to go down to the ladder. 
God put them in the pedestal and they don't want to be there, they want to go down. But life is life. We are living in situations and uh, moments that are very difficult. I talked to you before about how difficult it is now to follow Torah and how difficult it is to follow the principles of the Torah and how difficult it is to follow what is right versus what is wrong that has become now the things of the, of the time. I am surprised sometimes by people when I hear people defending things that are totally, totally, that go against humanity, you know? But uh, they say for the sake of, you know, freedom or whatever they, they want to call it, they do certain things that are totally con contrary to what our creators wanted from the beginning. In these two last parashats, there are two parts. The, 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 the first portion, Matot, is going to start uh, speaking about the vows. Um, and it's going to be very specifically, especially uh, in relationship with women. And the vows about what women, or what men made the vow they need to fulfill it. But with women, they are going to give it a, a certain uh, a possibility that the, the vows can be annulled. Women that are still under the parents' uh, uh, protection, or the women that are married under the husband' uh, protection. This has been a, a, a problem in Judaism for many, many years, because this idea about if the woman can perform and can speak, can talk in front in public, you know, um, because of of being under the authority of the father or the husband. Then he gives something that is very interesting. The uh, widows or the divorcees women, now they can hold to their word. Um, you can look at one way or the other. You can look as protection or you can look as something very special that the Torah is doing little by little. Um, in my way to look at the Torah, I see how the Torah, in comparison to other civilization prior to giving the Torah, especially in the Middle Eastern, the Mediterranean, and the Mesopotamian area, you know, all those codex that were developed, how women were treated. And you need to remember, that women were considered second category, to say the least. And they were a commodity. I mean, women could be bought and sold. Uh, uh, um, and, the, and this will become a, a way that families will survive. You know, sometimes the partner has many daughters. You know, the only way that he could survive, he would give a, a, their daughters away and, and will receive a, a payment for it. Um, or also a way a, a, a parent that didn't have enough means to take care of their, their children will give it their daughter very early age to somebody else to take care of them and then to marry them. There was, there was a, a little by little women were considered, you know, a second kind and they were trying to be elevated. The Torah does that. It's going to elevate the woman to the same level of men in certain situations. And here, when he gives to the, to the widow and to the divorcee the opportunity to say, now you, whatever you say, you know, is going to be hold to you personally. That means uh, people look it down, but at the truth of the matter is if we, if, if we look at the time that was written this, we are seeing that the woman is being elevated. And, and this is important. Now, what happened with a single woman that had never been married, and suddenly his parents and his, uh, uh, everything had the, uh, disappeared, and it's by herself, you know? The idea is that she's going to also act as her own. Even if her own family cannot take care of her, she needs 
to be now on her own. If these ideas were progressively developed with the time. Um, the rabbis were telling us uh, about how a woman uh, could, uh, little by little, could be more uh, independent or responsible. But are all depending about the groups, all depending about the, the, the types of leadership that you have, how people interpret the scriptures. And my understanding is that always our Creator has given to the woman a special protection. And the, the, the greater protection that has been given to the woman is against men. It's interesting. You know, protect, the woman has been constantly being protected against men, teaching men that they needed to protect the woman, needed, needed to respect the woman, and needed to elevate the woman to a level of humanity. Uh, in this portion then, we are going to have, after that, the, we call the vengeance that uh, Moshe asked to the people of Israel against the Midianites, uh, uh, because of what happened in the case of Simri and Cosby, Pinehas uh, uh, or Pinhas, uh, the Kohen, who killed them. And he sent us as the as the uh, Kohen to go to war. And he's going to take the trumpets and, and he's going to be uh, a, basically praying for the people of Israel for the battle. Now, uh, in this process, we look at Bilan, or Balan, the prophet, the, who here is discovered who really, who he was. You know, the question is why Bilan was there. Supposedly he went back to his, to, to his country, no? to Aram. To, and and he, he came back, and he is there in the middle of the battle, and he is killed. There are many Midrashim about how uh, Mila, uh, Bilan was killed, and one is that Pinchas himself killed Bilan, in other that was Moshe Raveno himself, you know, all depending on which Midrash you, you read. But the, the truth of the matter uh, that I like to see about the principles of the Torah is that there is a, a basic principle in the Torah that is constantly there. Whoever mess with Israel, sooner or later they are going to pay for it. Not because Israel is powerful, not because Israel is the most uh, the outstanding uh, nation in the world, the most numerous nation in the world, but uh, it's because who is with Israel, who is the one that is taking care of Israel. You can read it up in the Barim Hasefer, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7. Eight and nine, very clear. Anyway, this morning I, I want to go to the uh, the next. Then comes the by the way the partition of the land. You have Ruben and God, and then the has tribe of Manashe. Uh, they ask Moshe Rabbeinu to stay in the other side of the Jordan. Uh, at the beginning, Moshe didn't react the well, but then later on he said. You can go if, only if you leave your family here, but you go with the rest of Israel, with your men, to fight for the conquering of the, of the other lands. You know, um, that was the way that the land was given by lots. The largest tribe would receive more land. The smaller tribe would receive less land. But uh, all of the land was given by lot. What I mean by lot? that nobody could choose their own land. But uh, here we have uh, Reuben, God, and Manasseh that are choosing their land. But it's interesting about the many ideas about this, but uh, they, they choose in the other side of the Jordan. You know? Uh, interestingly enough, when comes the first, uh, uh, when they, they come uh, the, in the invasion of, of the kingdom of Israel, the tribes that want to disappear first by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, are who, which, which tribes are? The, the Reuben, God, and Manasseh. You know, because they are dispersed, the first one, they are in the front. Anyway, 
we go now to Marseille, the journeys. And he, uh, here, at the ending of this, uh, the, the book of the uh, Bar, we are going to see that there is a description of different uh, stations that is going to do Israel during the time of, from this, leaving Egypt to the time that they arrive to uh, the promised land. There are many, uh, there are three accounts in different ways. The beginning in, in, in the book of Shemot, Exodus, then we had the account of the book of uh, in Numbers, and also we had the account of the Barim. And they don't coincide. But there is a, there is a lot of reason why there is the, it's a very interesting study about to say how could be seen. The best way that I can express to you is, is in this way, that it is the intention of how this uh, uh, journey was described. Many times it's described to tell how Israel has certain special situations and how they fail and how they need to return to God and to teach to the next generation how uh, our Creator deals with disobedience and with, with situation and the need to come back to Him. Another way to, to look at it is about special times in which Israel had an encounter with the eternal God and, and how the leaders work with it. There are many, uh, many positions of our sages about how we can compare or how we can relate to this um, to this journey. For example, uh, the, the count number 8 and number 13 uh, in, in the numbers and they accumulate a different journeys in, in, in group or grouping. And number 8 means the ending of the, uh, or the beginning of the covenant. No? And number 13, that is the number Ehad, was the representation of our God, our Creator. Now then you're going to see the, the numbers and the playing uh, in this way. That is a very special study that we need to do in, in those areas that I will leave it for another opportunity. But uh, the point that I want to bring to you about these journeys, there is a passage uh, that called my attention when I was doing the study of this uh, parasha. And I would like for you to go with me to chapter 33 at the end, from verses 50 to the end. Then the Lord spoke to Moshe in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan to the land of Canaan, you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you, and you shall destroy all their prostrations, stones, all their molten images shall you destroy, and all their high places shall you demolish. You shall possess the land, and you shall settle in it. For to you have I given the land to possess it. You shall give it the land as an inheritance by lot to your families. To the many you shall increase inheritance, and to the few you shall decrease its inheritance. Whatever is Lord shall fall. He shall be according to the tribes of your father, shall you inherit it. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, those of them whom you leave shall be pins on your eyes and torn on your side. And they will harass you upon the land in which you dwell. And look at how that finish. And it shall be that what I had meant to do to them, I shall do to you. 
to me, I call the Torah about no rules and regulations, but about principles. And when I was reading this, you know, I, I like political science a lot, and I and look at the world in geopolitics, and I has, you know that I look to uh, at the news, and I like to see what is going on in the world, especially with Israel. I can tell you who is now the Prime Minister, I can tell you who is in the party, but how, what is going on in Israel and part of the fights outside, and how Israel is being persecuted by the world. It is terrible what is happening to Israel. You know, if you were a very objective person, you will think in this way. If you are not a Jewish person, and you look a little bit in Israel, and if you were open-minded, you will ask this simple question. Why Israel is suffering so many things from all over the world. Why this free hate, I call it, against Israel? Now, what Israel has done to the world to be hated in that way? And then you start examining, and you're going to see that Israel is totally the country. The country who has blessed more humanity is Israel. You will say, ah, because you're Jewish and, and you're biased. You know, how many people can hear that? But I try to examine, even in the modern times, in our modern times, you know, we consider a little bit of Israel, they say that the population of all Jewish people around the world will be no more than 15 million right now. I'm a young Israeli. You know? In more than two billion, only Chinese and, and the rest of the world, they say that at least they want to be another four billion. You know, little bit of Israel. Have you ever counted about the Nobel prizes? You know that the largest percentage of Nobel prizes by a group, by any group, is in the hands of the Jewish people. That little bit people, in comparison with the rest of the world, do we need to think about that there is something there? When Abraham Avinu was giving the calling from our creator to go to the promised land, and then he said, to those who bless you will be blessed, and to those who curse you will be cursed, and you will be a blessing. You and your descendant will be a blessing to all humanity. This is to see the blessings of your realm. If today you are curious, and now you can Google this, and uh, you can find which is the country that is more advanced now in technology and doing certain things, uh, have more inventions and has more uh, requests for uh, uh, permits and, and say how when you you invent somebody patents. something, huh? patents. Uh, they have, they, the country that has more patents, okay, pending also, little bit you know uh, about many of the things, and your cellular phone, many things about technology and computer, everything comes from Israel. Microsoft wouldn't exist without Israel. But nobody talks about uh, even medicine, the things that are happening. All the advances, a little bit of Israel. And everybody is worried about what Israel is going to do to those poor people that are in the borders. Now, just recently, I received a, through email in YouTube a lady who was a Muslim living in Israel, and she was in a special program about a chef or something like that, cooking program. And 
she was talking about, she's Muslim, she's Arab, and she lives in Israel, and she said that she's a Zionist. You know, and that was interesting because her son was kicked out and he was beat up by his own people because they were defending Israel. And she said this. And I wonder you understand this picture because here I'm going to develop something more. She said, and, and also all the Arab people who live in Israel have said the same thing, is that the, today, at this moment that I am speaking to you, to you, the Arabs are best protected. They don't need to worry about themselves. They don't want to live in Israel. Because any Arab Muslim who lives outside Israel, their life is clinging on a little thread. Why? Because they are killing among themselves. The different factions of Islam are killing each other, and they're killing among themselves. Then, I come, I, I give you this small background right now, in order to understand the Torah, and to understand the principles that our Creator is giving to us. Israel is a very special commodity, if I can call it in that way. It's a commodity that is going to be the influence and helping the world. You know, or Leoyim, be light to the world. Israel has a purpose, has a role. Any time that Israel tries to change the role, suffer the consequences. And it's very interesting today in Israel, most of the people in Israel they would like to be like other nations. Why? Because if I, if I am like other nations, maybe they will not want to bother me anymore. Because there must be a reason why I am bothered so much. You know? I am talking about people who do not even believe in a supreme being. Not because you are an Israeli, not because you are a Jew, you believe in God, you will be surprised that there is a great majority of Jewish people who do not believe in God. They believe in the ethnicity, in the community, in those kind of things, but they don't believe in God. You know, uh, I have talked to people like that, and, and I always say, if you call yourself a Jew, and you do not believe in, in God, where are, you, where are you hold yourself, you know? And you say, in our ethnicity, in our customs and traditions. And where that customs and tradition come from? Okay. You cannot separate. But, well, it's another part, other issue. Uh, I am bringing you little things because what I want for you to see the, the whole perspective about the issue about that when the Lord say at the end, and it shall be that when I mean to them, I shall do to you. I mean, in other words, what I was going to do to them, if you don't take care of these people, I will do the, to you what they will do to uh, what I was planning to do to them. Now, let's talk about separation, because this is important, and today it's very important. In Israel, right now, we are under the cloud of Iran. The Iranians about the prospect about producing the atomic bomb. United States and the other five very strong countries, interestingly enough, uh, uh, those ones who were interested to supposedly to stop the developing of Iran uh, atomic bomb. They never counted with Israel. And United States being the, the greatest country or the biggest country in the world, the greatest power, uh, didn't count it with Israel for anything, totally the country, took it, Israel out of the, the program. And the one that was going to be more affected than any other country in the world by Iran.
Iran's production of a nuclear, of a nuclear bomb was going to be rare. Iran has promised that they want to destroy Israel, you know, disappear Israel. And uh, uh, like a Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu said, uh, and they said to it in the Congress of the United States when he spoke, the Iranians, they talk about two uh, Satan, the big Satan and the little Satan. And they say to the United States, you are considered the big Satan, then you need to be more worried than, than us sometimes. You know, we have been do doing uh, all the, the dirty job for you, but you need to be sure that, that you can be also taking on this. But what is happening? Is the problem in the United States? Is the problem in Russia? Or France? Or Germany? Countries that they are there behind it, they, they, they are to try to put uh, Iran and to say Iran calm down. You know the theory of appeasement is the worst theory that can be in a peace process. And the people try to appease. And appeasement has never worked. Why? Because when you try to appease somebody, that, per, that all the group think that they are very strong and, and they are afraid of them and they cannot stop me. And I want to continue. I want to be the bully on, on, on the, in the area. And um, how do you stop a bully? The, the only way that you can stop a bully is with very, very uh, punch the nose. No? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and you're going to see that the bully and won't be any longer a bully. But meanwhile you say, please don't do this to me, I want to do this for you. What is that? It's a blackmailing. And, and we don't want that you get upset. You know? This has been the process of this nation. They have not dealt with the real issues. They say, we have to stop Iran to build for 10 to 15 day, uh, years the nuclear uh, capacity, the nuclear bomb. Who knows what is going to happen in 10 to 15 years? You know? And, uh, but they have not told him or her, I don't know if it's Iran, it's like him or her, uh, they have not told. They have not been told that they cannot keep bullying. They are the greatest now uh, supporters of terrorism in the Middle Eastern area. And they are getting to them. We have Hezbollah and you have other groups in the area. And they are fighting against ISIS, that is very interesting. They are supporting a revolution in, in Yemen and all over, over in Lebanon, uh, sorry, uh, also in, in, Lib in Lebanon, in the area of Syria and Lebanon. And they keep growing and supporting them. Now they want to open their coffers again. They want to have more money to support more of we ask ourselves, are our leaders smart enough? Do they know what they are doing? Um, and maybe we talk because we have mouth, but we don't know what is going on really under the, the carpet. You never ever are going to win anything with appeasement. Or you stop it, or you let it in to take over. Appeasement doesn't work. And we know we have seen through history. One of the greatest examples that I remember no long ago, in the before the Second World War in England, this great minister Chamberlain, who brought the peace treaty with Hitler. And you know what happened? 
are we can we learn from history? Or we commit we keep committing the same mistakes. Why our creator is telling us get rid of these people? Because if you let them to be with you, they are going to be a pain on the neck to you for the next generation. You know, when Israel, well, the division of Israel was, was given, you know, by the, by the United Nations, because of the conscience that it was so, uh, so heavy that, that they had allowed this happened to the Jewish people. By the way, all the nations of the world, all the nations of the world knew about the concentration camps in the, during the Second World War. That was no secret. But I was made a special decision by the leaders not to stop those concentration camps until they finish the war. Okay? This is, this is a fact. And now, the, the guilty conscience, they tell them, you know, let these people to have a little land. And the land that was given to them was impossible to take care of. But Israel was happy with a little land. And little by little, um, you know, the story needs to be very clear. You know who were called Palestinians? The Israelis. You know, the Jerusalem Post, before being called Jerusalem Post, was called the Palestinian Post. And the, the Palestinians were the Jews, and the Arabs were the Arabs. Do you know that the Palestinian state doesn't exist? It's totally a fabrication of the imagination and the, the, the leaders of the, of the Arab countries and the free countries. Do you know that the Middle East was divided by two powers? Great Britain and France. And they made artificial countries with artificial boundaries. But nobody wants to learn a little bit about history. Many of those people didn't exist, or not the country. Iraq never existed. Iraq is a country conglomerate of different nations. Syria, who is the oldest ones, with the Damascus, you know, they had a group, but they had different groups inside them, still today. And you ask yourself, why those situations are happening right now? The answer again is, when men try to do their own things in their own way, when there is only the reason of what I can gain, not what is the best for the people. This is when all these things comes down to destruction. Israel suffered that bad decision of giving Israel a, a territory that was not even defensible. But Israel started gaining more territory, little by little. And, the, and the, the territory that they were gaining was not because Israel started the war. They start the war against Israel. And then they were eliminating these people. And suddenly, they created a people called the Palestinians, or the refugees. Do you know that they have been created another group in the United Nations, specifically by the refugees of Palestinians? Because there was already a section for refugees, but still 
working today in the United Nations, but are only special for the so-called Palestinians. And the Arab countries, they didn't want to take all these people to their country. Do you know that most of the Palestinians, or are Jordanians, or Egyptians, those ones who are from, from Gaza are Egyptian, and those who are from the border from Shomron, you know, they are Jordanians. Ask where they were born, ask where the families come from. But why the Arab country, they never wanted to accept them, because if they accepted them, their claim was going to be erased. Nobody say anything about the, all the refugees that they came from Yemen, from Iraq, from Iran, that Israel took them and absorbed them. Little bit of Israel. But uh, these nations uh, were huge territories and with huge amount of wealth. They don't give a penny to their own people because they are their own people. But they keep them in that situation. Who is playing? Israel. I mentioned last week that in the, in, uh, the United Nations has more sanctions against Israel than the combined all nations, the worst nations in the world. Then let's go back to this portion. They want to prickle in your eyes and they are going to be stabbing you, they are going to be torn on your sides. Oh. Meanwhile, Israel wants to be like any other nations. There always is going to be in progress. Because trying to be like any other nations, the only thing that they are getting is worse and worse. We are not like the other nations. We are Israel. And Israel is very special. It's not based on religion. It's based on principles. A means that our Creator has given us a role to play. And this role is also, Israel has accepted a lot of people who are not ethnically Jewish, we can call it that way but it has come to be part of Israel, and now they are a very strong force of Israel. What are you trying to tell us with it? That when God calls, God transforms. And when God transforms, God gives it to you the opportunity to do what is right according to the thing that you have. What I mean is this, all of us, we have something special. All of us, we have been given something in particular that is uh, like a, a gift. We have certain characteristics or qualities. And you will be surprised that you and I were important in this role even that we look like insignificant in the eyes of the world. We are special because who is with us? Israel cannot be destroyed. The scripture tells us. Then, when he said, I will do to you what I was planning to do to the others, right now Israel is suffering that. Israel is suffering because our Creator is allowing things to happen to Israel. The only thing I need to say to Israel is, wake up Israel, wake up. We don't need to be like the other nations. We are a special nation. Not to be proud in the sense that we are better than others, but to say our role is different to the role of the other nations. And we have, 
the responsibility to be the guide, to be the orlegoyin, to be light to the world. And we are even sometimes against ourselves. We are still being the guidance and being the light. Hasak, Hasab and Hase. Be strong, be strengthened. This is what our Creator is letting us to know at this time. Shabbat Shalom.